Last Sunday we started a series called The Only Solution. And solutions are very, very important to me because I'm the kind of person that does not like problems. Anybody here like that other than me? I don't. I am a fixer. Y'all know people like that. My, my wife will come home and she's venting about things that are happening or something that's going on. And in my mind, I'm hearing problem that Dale needs to fix. Yeah, some of you guys know exactly what I'm talking about, right? It has created stress in our relationship at times. It's created stress both ways. One way it's created stress is because I try to fix things that she didn't want me to fix. Ain't nothing like getting up in somebody's business when they didn't want you up in their business. You know what I'm saying? Other ways it's created stress is I have, I have got frustrated because I'm thinking she's asking me to fix something and I'm saying, I can't do nothing about that. You need to do something about it for yourself. She said, I didn't say I want you to do anything about this. It's just created a thing. But I'm a fixer. As a matter of fact, if I find out there's something that I can't fix, I, I don't like to be around. I don't like things I can't fix. I try to stay clear of them. I try to, I try to, I feel burdened by them. I only want to be around things where I can fix. You say, well, Dave, you're a control freak. Like I didn't know that. Say something original already. <laughs> I, you're right. I mean, because I like to fix things and I like to analyze things. I don't. That's the reason I'm not a good board member. I don't like going to meetings. I don't like being on people's boards because boards they 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 take minutes and waste hours. Have you noticed that? And they don't they don't get anything done. They just do it because I'm a fixer. I like to fix things. I'm an action oriented person. And so what happens is when there's a problem, I have to sit back and analyze it. Well, during this political season, I think we've all realized that we got some problems in America. Anybody want to say amen to that? We got some big problems and the problems that we got that we have now as a nation, I really don't believe that the government's going to ever be able to fix them. I don't think they're going to have the solution. I don't think Congress is going to pass a law to fix the suicide rate among our military victims. I just don't think it's going to happen. I don't think that Congress is going to fix a law to create the to, to fix the divorce rate that we've got. I don't think it can happen. I think the problems that we've got, the greed, the, the, the self-centeredness is so systemic, so foundation, so ingrained in our culture that I really don't think a simple solution is going to be the answer. I think we've got some really deep-seated problems. And so last week, if you were here, I went ahead and gave it away. I honestly believe the only solution is Jesus. In fact, we had that all over Facebook that the answer for my situation is Jesus. And I really believe that. If you didn't get it, then listen to it. And the reason is because God created us for a relationship with Him, but our sin has broken that relationship. And now we walk around with this void and this emptiness and we're searching and we're hoping and we're looking for something that's never going to be found. And we go from drug to drug, relationship to relationship, habit to habit, looking for something to fill it. And you won't find it because the only solution is who? Jesus. And I believe that with all my heart. He's the only hope. And so therefore, the best thing we can do is to be able to introduce people to Jesus. And that's hard to do. Can I get anybody to say amen to that? Amen. Because it's hard to talk to people about Jesus, right? You can go to work and talk to people about God, morality, the church. You know, you can even say God bless you. You can even say I'll be praying for you. But when you get down to talk to people about Christmas season's coming up. And it's going to be a debate. Do we say happy holidays or merry Christmas? Because see, that's the problem. It's got Christ in it, which is that word, right? That we can't talk about at schools and we can't talk about or we lose our job. And we've got to be careful about because the deal is Jesus is so controversial. But here's the deal. And see, some of you have tried, some of you have gone to work and you've got wrote up because you're talking about Jesus and they don't like Jesus and they call you you know, you got to keep your religion out of here. I mean, all this kind of stuff. Some of you know, you've already tried. Some of you have offended people because of that. I mean, you've already done that whole Jesus thing. And others of you, you've never tried. You stay clear of it because there's two things you don't talk to people about. What are they? Politics and religion. So you kind of grew up with that. So you don't talk about it. You don't talk about it. Because your attitude is, well, it's kind of a private thing. And it's kind of between me and God. And I just want to tell you up front, that's not biblical, Okay. This whole deal about it being a private thing, that is not a biblical concept. And matter of fact, that is something your granddaddy might have told you, and it might be the safe way, but it's not the biblical way. And let me tell you why. Because if you continue to think that Christianity is a private thing between you and God, and you don't need to talk about it, people go to hell on that plan. You know why? Because Christianity is not intuitive. 
You can't come up to... Christianity is not a superior code of ethics. It's not just a great way of morality. It's not just a, a kind of a religious group that keeps you moving. Christianity is not about that. Christianity is based in something that happened in history. And you can't learn history without somebody telling you. You can't go to the beach and sit at a beach or under a tree and think, let me see if I can come up with how America became a nation. Let me see if I can remember... I'm, you don't know about Columbus unless somebody told you. You don't know about George Washington unless somebody told you. You don't know about Abraham Lincoln unless somebody told you. And you can't know how to get into heaven unless somebody tells you. You won't come up with history on your own. Here it is that Jesus Christ died and was buried and in three days rose again. Amen. See, that's not intuitive. You can't get that out of yourself. Somebody has to tell you about Jesus, or you'll never go to heaven. So we have to talk about this, but it's hard to do, and it's very, very difficult to do. And if you're not a church person, and you maybe came to church today because somebody bribed you, or somebody twisted your arm, or whatever, you just kind of came, I'm so glad you're here, because today, I think maybe if you've been kind of confused by the church, and what is the church about, today I think you're going to get an idea of what the church is supposed to be about, and today in a very real sense, it's kind of like I'm pulling back the curtain and letting you see behind the curtain of what the church is supposed to be about, what it's built on, and all that kind of stuff, and, and I'm, I'm thinking today, it might start making sense, and at the very least, if you've got a mama who's been worrying you to death about coming or a best friend who's like, just come, just come, just come. And you've got people who are just aggravating you about stay in church, stay in church, stay in church. At the very least, today you'll understand why they're doing that, okay? At the very least, maybe you'll understand why we're so passionate about it. Today we're going to look at a passage in Matthew. We're going to look at several, but the primary one's in Matthew 16. And Matthew was a tax collector, and God let him write part of the Bible. So, no matter what you've done, there's hope for you, right? <laughs> Anyway, anyway, there you go. Alright, so Matthew was a tax collector and God let him write part of the Bible. We're going to look at Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20 and then we're going to look at some other verses. Ready? When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say the Son of Man is? Now, that's kind of a strange question, isn't it? Try that out tomorrow. Alright, just sit down with guys in the break room and say, hey, 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 hey guys, listen. What are people saying about me? Tell me what they say, Amber. Let's start with you, Jack. What do you think? You know, what's with, How about you, Philip? You know what they're going to probably tell you? There ain't nobody saying nothing about you. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you, you just you. You know, there ain't nobody. As a matter of fact, the only person talking about you is you. You know? We could care less who you are. You know what I mean? But anyway, this is the reason Jesus could do this is because it was the same then as it is now. Jesus is a controversial subject, and it is now. And the problem is you can't be neutral on the subject of Jesus. You've got to have I mean, one way or the other. You're either for him or against him and whatever. So Jesus could ask this question, hey, tell me who people say that you are. And so then who uh, say that I am? So then they give these weird replies. Some say John the Baptist, which is really weird because just a few weeks earlier, John the Baptist had actually died, and Jesus was alive then. So that's really weird. This is reincarnation in a weird kind of way. Others say Elijah, which he had got caught up, and so they think maybe he'd come back. So others, Jeremiah, which was a prophet that had died, which was one of the prophets. So these people believe in reincarnation. These guys are saying... People around town, they know you're from God, and they know you're kind of special. They know you've got something unique about you, but uh, they don't really know what you are, you know? And so they just kind of make up all these answers. There's a lot of confusion, you know? There's a lot of confusion. So then Jesus asks the question, and I just want to say this before I set this up here. If you're kind of disconnected from God, and you're not sure where you are with God, and this whole God thing is kind of new to you, and you're not sure about you, this is the question. I know you got other questions in your mind. That's why you don't come to church every Sunday. That's not why, and that's why you're not sure if you want to commit your life to the Lord. Because you got other questions, right? You got questions like, if God is a good God, then why do bad things happen to good people? Uh, that's a good question. You got questions like, how did the Bible come into reality, and how can we really trust it? And all that? and you got questions like, even like, how about the dinosaurs? I mean, you got all sorts of questions, right? But this is the question. This is the question above all questions. This is the most important question you'll ever answer. This is the question about all questions. Jesus says in real time, right now, but what about you, he asked. Ready? Read this next part with me. Underline. Next question out loud. One, two, three. Who do you say I am? In real time, right now, this is the question you have to answer. See, a lot of you don't want to get involved with church because you don't like the politics the church has got involved in. And I understand that. 
Some of you have not gotten involved in church because you think church is all about morality and where we come down on morality issues. Some of you have not gotten involved with church because you kind of got this spiritual thing that all roads lead to God and all this kind of stuff. And so you just want to stay clear to the whole Jesus thing and, and all this stuff. You see, the church gets wrapped up in a lot of different questions. And a lot of questions you've got in your mind are good questions. And you need to sort them out. And, and God will help you sort them out. But at the end of the day, this is the bottom line. This is the question you've got to answer. At the risk of sounding whatever, if you get it wrong, there's eternal consequences to it. Who do you say Jesus is? You will never answer a question that is more important than that. Who is Jesus? That is the question that you have to answer. And Jesus says right now, real time, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, listen up, ready? You're the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I've concluded, that's who I've concluded on. You're sitting two feet from me right now. Jesus, you got the same haircut as me. you got the same beard as me. you got the same sandals as me. you got the same robe as me. And I've been walking around with you. I've been hanging out. And I've decided you're not just a good preacher. I've decided you're just not somebody from God. I've decided you're not a reincarnate of somebody. I've decided that you're not anything like that. I have decided that you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and you've come here to deliver all of us. You are God. Hallelujah. That's what he said. That's what it came down to. And you tell I'm going to get fired up up in here today. I hope y'all all right with that. <laughs> Woo! This is emotional. It's hugely emotional. He says, this is what I've decided that you are. And here's what Jesus said. Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. For this was not revealed to you by flesh and blood, but by my Father in heaven. In other words, hey, you got it right, but you didn't get it right on your own. You kind of cheated because the only way you would have known that is God had told you that. But you got the right answer. That's awesome. And I tell you that you are Peter. And Simon is saying, that's, that's not my name. I've been hanging out with you now for a while. I'm not, my, my, my name's Simon. I'm, I'm changing your name. You can't change my name. I'm a grown man. I'm changing your name. Because what you just did was huge. What you just did was bigger than life. This is such a historical moment. I am changing your name. You're no longer going to be called Simon. You're going to be called Peter. Peter, you know what that means? It means stone. I mean, we, don't, we got rocky, but we don't have stone. You can't call somebody stone. I mean, that's like saying, I'm changing your name, Brian. You're now Bulletin. I mean, what? you, know, you just don't do that, right? <laughs> He just, he just changed his name and said, hey, I'm calling you Stone. And it's not like Stone like Big Stone. It's Stone like stone like you sit beside the road and you sharpen a knife and on. It's a stone you can actually put in your hand, Stone. And he says, I'm going to call your name Stone because this is such a big deal. I'm changing your name. I'm changing romance. And so now you're going to be called Stone, a stone like you can hold, on, hold in your hand. And then notice what he says, and I... And, and uh, you'll be called Peter, and on this rock. Now, right now, that word is different than the word he just used for Peter. You see, Peter was like a little stone that you can hold in your hand stone. This word that he used right here is gigantic, huge, bigger than life, tombstone, big rock, cliff, side of a mountain, stone. One, a stone that you can't move, a stone you can't push out of the way, a stone that two or three grown men can't pick up. He says, hey, you're going to be called stone, little stone, and I'm going to say, on this gigantic big rock, on this statement that you just made, this unmovable statement that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, on that huge, gigantic, big truth, I will. Will is future tense. It is not right now. One day in the future, I will. It hasn't started yet. Build what? What's that next word? My Church. We're going to talk about church in just a few minutes. And the gates of Hades or the gates of hell will not prevail against it. 
And notice that, future tense, will not, will not, will not. In other words, will not under any circumstances, and it don't say prevail in this textbook, it says overcome it. Now, let me just stop right here. I believe at this moment, all of heaven just fell silent. I believe at this moment, something huge just happened. Something said, he says, Peter, you've got the right answer. I'm the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And I'm going to call you stone because you got that right. But the stone like is a little stone. I'm going to call, I'm, I, on this big, gigantic statement you just made, I'm going to build a whole movement. I'm going to build a church. I'm going to move. And, and, and nobody's going to ever be able to take it away. Nobody's going to ever be able to mess with it. No matter what's thrown at it, it's going to survive. I'm going to build on that statement that you just made something called the church. Now, let me tell you about the church. The church, when we think of church, when he says that, you think Stanley Chapel. You think some of the churches that are around here in this area. You think that. But that is not what it meant in that day. Whenever Jesus used the word church in this context, it had no religious connotation at all. It was just a word. What church meant was ecclesia, and what it meant was the gathering of people in a civilization. In fact, what it typically was referred to, if you read Greek literature, this word that is used there before this connotation, before Jesus used it that day, what it meant was whenever the town wanted to come together and have a voting body, the people who were rich enough to vote would be called together, and so they would say, let's call together. We've got a decision about school systems here in Lee County. Let's call the church together and let them make a decision about the school system. And what that meant was you called anybody in society who had enough money to vote, and you called them together to let them make this decision. This was not considered to be a, a, a religious word or a religious organization. So what Jesus is trying to convey here, he says, guys, on this statement that Stone just made, I am the Christ, the Son of the living God. On that statement, I'm going to launch this whole movement. I'm going to launch this whole kingdom. I'm going to launch this whole civilization on that one statement and the common denominator among everybody in my kingdom is not going to be the color of their skin. It's not going to be the language that they speak. It's not, going to be the, it's not going to be any of that. The common denominator for all those that are part of my civilization, that are part of my kingdom, that are part of my movement, is going to be this one statement that Stone just made. The common denominator is that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God, and on that statement, I will build my movement, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Nothing that the devil tries to come against that movement will stop it. You cannot stop that movement because it's my movement and I'll build it. There's an amen belongs right there. This is huge. And I bet those 12 guys are going, really? You're, you're going to start a movement. Alright, let's see. There's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. 12 of us, random people, fishermen, tax collectors, weirdos, people who nobody likes anyway. They're not even sure they like you. We're in musky, dusky Israel, Palestine here, and you're going to build a kingdom. <coughs> really? You know? Jesus says, count it. I mean, count it. I want to change your name, your stone. I'm, I'm telling you, that you can mark it down. You can write it in your book. You can smoke it in your pipe. He probably didn't say smoke it in his pipe. I added that part. He says, you can write it down. <laughs> You can write it down. You can count on it. I'm telling you, you can mark it down. There's going to be a new group, and I'm going to build on it, and nothing's going to stop it, and the common denominator is going to be that statement that just was made, that I am the Son of God, that I am the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And you know what? 2,000 years later, here we say it. Ain't that great? 2,000 years later, here we say it. And not only us, but around the world today. And if you were to take all the Christians, and we got all these different styles of worship, we got all these different styles of doing communion. We got all these different styles of doing baptism. We got different schools. We got different songs. We got different traditions. We got different rules. We got different guidelines. We got all this different stuff. But if you take all the Methodists, all the Presbyterian, all the Pentecostals, all the all the people and put them in a room and said, "All of you guys, what do y'all have in common?" You know what we would all say, even if we sing hymns and wear robes or we wear jeans and whatever. You know what we would all say is that we believe. Jesus is the Son of the living God. 
That's what we all believe. That's the common denominator. Christianity is not about a building. The church was not about a location. It's a movement. And today, a third of the world's population believes that He is the Son of the living God. And you know what He says? He says, I'm going to build. You know what? That means that it's going to be this big, then it's going to be this big, then it's going to be this big, then it's going to be this big, and it's just going to keep going and going and going and going and going, and it's going to get larger every generation. Every generation is going to keep getting larger and it's keeping bigger and bigger. Now, it's not bigger in America right now. There's less Christians per capita than has ever been in the history of this nation, which grieves me to say. But let me tell you about the church worldwide. There are more Christians today than there's ever been, and it is exponentially growing around the world. His movement is bigger than America. His movement is bigger than us. His movement is bigger than anything that's going on right here. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And you know what that means? That means you can't stop it. He says, you can't stop it. The gates of hell are not going to overcome it. No matter what you throw at it, you won't stop the church. No matter what you throw at it, I mean, and you would think it would be stopped by now. Have you noticed the church keeps getting a bad press? Have y'all noticed that? Have you noticed there's been a whole lot of immorality and hypocrisy inside of the church? Have you noticed there's been a lot of crazy people in the church? Have you noticed that Christians, as the most part, have been extremely lazy? Look at other faiths that don't even believe in Jesus. They're a lot more active than we are a lot of times. We're extreme. I mean, it has endured bad press. It has endured immorality. It's endured poor leadership. It's endured lazy Christians. We've had crusades. We've had hostile governments. We've had church divisions. We've had persecution. We've had every op op you know, opposition you can possibly imagine. And it just goes on and on and on and on and gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Nations have tried to stamp it out. Communism tried to educate it out of us. And nobody can do it because no matter what you throw at the church, it just repels and it keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and goes on and on and on and on and on. You know why? Because Jesus says, I will build my church. And nothing's going to stop it. So you can like it or lump it. <laughs> you can get on board or not, but the bottom line is the kingdom of God is bigger than you. And nothing's going to stop it. And you know why it keeps going? Because he builds on that one statement. That I am the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Whew. Isn't that awesome? Unbelievable. So if you want something to give your life to, I'm telling you, man, you find something more powerful than that. There ain't no stock market got a bigger guarantee than that. There ain't no company got a bigger guarantee than that. When you're part of the church, you're part of something that is never going to die and is guaranteed to succeed. Isn't that good? So then he says, I will, again, future tense, not right now. It's not going to happen right now. When he's saying this, it's going to be in the future. In the future, you disciples, you listen to me. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. Now, keys are a sign of authority. When you say that's the key holder, that means that's a person who has authority. Whenever you give people a key to the building, you give them authority. Whenever you give keys to your kids to the car, that's a major sign of authority, right? Liberty. Let me know if you do that. I'd like to stay off the road. I know your kids. Just kidding. These are key holders. The key holders have access. They have authority. He said, I'm going to give you the keys. I'm going to give you the authority. I'm going to give you access. So that whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. In other words, you're going to have the authority to bind people to this citizenship. You're going to have authority to bind people to this movement. I'm calling the church right here. But I'm not going to use the word church in this sermon because you're thinking church right here. But he says, I'm going to give you the authority to bind people to my movement. To bind people to my civilization. I'm going to give you that authority to do that. 
And I'm going to give you the authority to lose people. Because if you don't treat people right, if you don't handle them right, you can actually loose them from the kingdom of God. And you can decide by its own word. And there's something called church discipline. There's a lot of things that are wrapped up in what he's about to say that we find out later on about. But I'm giving you the authority to bind people like glue to the kingdom. And I'm giving you the authority to loose people to the, from the kingdom. Did you realize you've got that kind of authority as a Christ follower? He said, I'm giving you the keys to the kingdom. I'm giving you access. I'm giving you authority. I'm giving you this power that is here. And then two things, there's two things going on here. I want you to make sure you understand what just happened. Because for the last sentence, and, and, and set up for where we're going, what's just happened is Jesus said, who do people say that I am? Well, you know, they don't really know. Well, who do you say that I am? Peter says, I think you're the son of the Messiah, the son of the living God. And Jesus says, on that statement, on that foundation, on that big rock, I'm going to build this movement and nothing will stop it. It's going to happen in the future. It's not going to happen now. It's just us 12 guys right now. But it's going to be a bigger movement. It's going to be a whole civilization and nothing's going to slow it down. And let me give you, I'm going to let you have a part in it. I'm going to let you help me build it if you want to. I will hand over to you some authority and some keys and you'll have access to be able to help me build Build this movement that I'm building. You track it with me? If you track it with me, say yes. yes. So then he says in this last statement, he said, then he ordered his disciples, right after he did that, to not tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Do what? <laughs> you just made this big statement and now you don't want to tell anybody that you're the Messiah? Yeah, it's not time. Future tense. Remember, I told you I'm going to do that later on. Not now. I'm just letting you know what's about to happen. I bet the disciples are like, when he walks away, when Jesus goes away to pray or something, they're like, is he on drugs or something? I mean, really. He's talking about a kingdom. There's 12 of us. He's given us authority. We don't even have a house. What are you talking about authority? Keys to a kingdom. We just want keys to a house, a key to a camel. We don't have anything. We used to be rich and we gave it all away to follow him. What is he talking about? Keys to the kingdom. How's he going to pull this off? But I bet you that conversation came back to their memory. Several days later, in Matthew 28, Jesus had died. He had resurrected. And then he stands and he says, Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Now let me pause just a second and set this up. What's happened when he makes that statement is he has already died a criminal's death on a cross and been nailed to a cross. And now he's been beaten, he's been humiliated, and everybody knows the name Jesus. Everybody knows the name of what that means. And everybody knows. And after that, they go to the tomb to find him. And he's not in the tomb. He's not there. So they pay these guards to go tell everybody that his body was stolen from the grave. But the problem with their lie is Jesus kept showing up around town talking to people. <laughs> Did you know the Bible says that over 500 people saw Him after He resurrected from the grave? So now 500 people in their little town who are well-adjusted, non-drug-using, tax-paying citizens say, we saw Him. He's talking. He's walking around. We saw Him die and we saw Him alive. And then He gets all those folks together and He says, now it starts. Why now? Because now I just defeated the most destructible, the, in the most indestructible human force in all of society, death. Walt Disney had his body frozen and thinks maybe one day somebody will overcome death. It ain't going to happen. Death will intrude in anybody's well-planned life. I don't care how much money you got. I don't care how much smarts you got. I don't care how, how healthy and how much you jog. And if you don't eat no Twinkies, you still are going to die one day. <laughs> if Jesus don't come back. You see, you can't beat death. You can beat poverty. You can beat, you can beat hair loss. You can beat cancer, but you can't beat death. Because death is more powerful than us. I ain't big hair loss. I said that because somebody got a hair weave, and I ain't gonna say who it was, but anyway, somebody got a hair weave going on up in there. I saw on the computer last week, but anyway, that's why I said that. Thought about it for a few minutes. I decided that I couldn't pull it off. Y'all laugh y'all's head off. I come up here with a hair full of hair. That won't in my notes, by the way. <laughs> you know, 
here's what I'm trying to say. When Jesus stood there on that hillside that day, he said, Now because I defeated death, all power in heaven and earth belongs to me. There will be no other. You can get, hey, you can, I'm going to make somebody mad right now, but you can decide to follow Muhammad or Buddha or whatever other God you want or whatever other religion you want to do. You show me anybody else who raises from the grave and over 500 people saw him, you ain't going to find him. You go to the tomb of Muhammad, you know what? You're going to find his bones. You go to the tomb of Buddha, you'll find his bones. You go to the tomb of Elvis, despite what some of you think, you'll find his bones. <laughs> but when you go to the tomb of Jesus, you know what you're going to find? A sign that says he's not here. He's risen, just as he said. Amen. Now, he said, I've got all authority, and I am giving that authority to you. And nobody's going to dethrone me. Nobody's going to take me off the throne. Now, because I've got all of authority, therefore, anytime you see the word therefore, you look to see what it's there for. <laughs> you know what it's there for? Because he's got all authority. Now, because of that, he wants you to, what's the next word? Go. Go. And what? Yes. Make disciples of, not of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even to the end of the age. In other words, it all starts now. I died, I resurrected, I'm ascending, and now you 12, y'all remember when I stood there and told you I was going to build a citizenship, a movement, but not now, but later, and I was going to give you the keys to the kingdom, and you were saying, you don't even have keys to a house, but now you got keys to the kingdom. Here's why I can give you keys to the kingdom. Because every power known to man, the most powerful in death, I defeated it. All authority is mine. I'm giving you authority. Now go and build my movement. And you know what they did? They went. And now we sit here 2,000 years later, all because those 12 guys took him serious at what he said. Now, Jesus chose in His wisdom to delegate His authority and responsibility to us. He has decided that we are His body. He has decided that we are the ones to go and tell people. You know what that means? That we are the closest thing people are going to get to to Jesus Christ on earth is us. And that's scary. That means when we love, we're loving for Christ. When we speak about Jesus, we're speaking as Christ. When we serve, we're serving as Jesus' body right here on earth. We've got this authority. And that's what's so new, so unique about us. We're probably the only civil, only, you know, people like trying to make us some kind of civic club or a nonprofit or something like that. We're probably the only ones in town who are required to stay focused on who's not here. You see, the church was never supposed to focus on its membership. In fact, when the church began to focus on its membership, it lost what Jesus was trying to do. The church was never to be focused on us. It was supposed to be focused on who's not here. We're supposed to always be making room at the table for more of God's people to be there. We're supposed to be on a search and rescue mission to make sure His movement is expanding and growing. And whenever a church begins to make it about them, this is what we like. This is the music we like. This is the thing we like. You've lost the focus of what Jesus was intending the movement to be about. Church was never to be about us. It was supposed to be about none should perish. Somebody say amen. I'm feeling alone right now. It was never supposed to be what we're what's up, what's up. It's supposed to be about none should perish. You have to stay focused. And that's the key. In a very real sense, we control how large the movement gets. I think the travesty of the local church in America, the reason there's less Christians per capita today than there's ever been is because we forgot this. We started making church about Christians. And church was never supposed to be about Christians. The movement was supposed to be about those non-Christians. Somebody said me and I'm feeling wrong. Anybody understand? And so what happened is the American church began to shrink. And what's been revealed to me this year is we control how large the church gets. In a very real sense, He gave us the keys to the kingdom. He's already given us His marching order. When you speak in Jesus' name, your word will have power. Not because you came to listen to me preach today, but because the Holy Spirit's inside of you. 
When you serve in Jesus' name, it has power. Because you have the Holy Spirit inside. He says, I'll give you that same authority that resurrected me from the grave. I'll give it to you. Now go use my power to be my witnesses. And to bring people to me. Everybody tracking with me? And when a church gets that, they flourish. You show me any church that's growing and any church that's died, and I can show you a church that gets this and a church that don't. Everybody with me? Yes. You know what this 1K commission has been about? You know, have you noticed Sandwich Chapel's flourishing lately? I mean, there was 309 people here last week. Wow. We baptized over 15 people last week, I think, somewhere along. I mean, it's incredible, incredible what God's doing in our body. But you know what I think is going on in our body right now? I think the reason God gave us the 1K commission that Kristen alluded to earlier, which is that God called us to reach 1,000 people over a four-year period for Jesus Christ. But you know what I think that's about? And I'm going to tell you, we're lagging a little bit behind. I don't know if we're going to make it or not. We're going to have to pick up the pace. And I've been, I don't like not making goals. I've been frustrated by that. I, that irritates me. And I've been praying about that. You know what I feel like the Holy Spirit said to me? He said, Dale, this was never about a thousand people. This was about changing Sandy Chapel because y'all were focused on. Amen. You won't focus on where you need to be. Have you noticed what's happened in the Stanley Chapel since we threw our energies behind the 1K Commission? I'm going to tell you, I'm ashamed to tell you this, but I'm going to go tell you because that's the way I roll. I have invited more people to church since we did this than I have the whole years I've been here as your pastor. I'm just telling you the honest truth. You know what else? Every month, over 500 invitations are going out, open house invitations that you're giving out. You weren't doing that before. You know why? Because God's changing us as a church. And that's why we got to go to two services. And that's why we got to get baptism takes longer. And that's why we had to get more trays for communion. And that's why it takes more bulletins. And that's why, because why? We have now got the heartbeat of the Father. And maybe we hadn't completely got it, but we're getting it. And we're some of you say, we ought to do this, we ought to do that, we ought to do this. We can't do all them ideas, but you know what? I am so glad that what we're praying. You know what I'm praying about now? I'm not praying God make my life more comfortable. I'm praying God. God, how can we reach more people for Christ? I'm not praying, God, how can we make things better for us? God, how can we reach more people for Jesus Christ? Because that has to consume us if I understand Jesus right. And when you do, the power of God will show up in incredible ways. Have y'all noticed? Have you noticed? That was a pitiful clap, but it's all right. We don't have time, okay? <laughs> Y'all just hang with me. I'm out of time, but I got to wind this baby up. I know you're trying. Let's just, just hold it down. Ready? Here we go. Ready? Got to listen faster. Have you noticed that the services here, every Sunday people come up to me saying, I, I, I've, been, I've been sober now for three weeks. We were on the verge of divorce, and we're going to stay together right now. And every week, if you're lost and you're here today, have you noticed there's something different? And is there times during that worship all ago that you had goosebumps that you felt like we were going to leave scars the next day? You know why? Because the power of God shows up when we get this. Yes. Here's what the Bible says. The Bible says that we're, for we're two or three gather in my name on official Jesus business, I'm with them. And that's the reason you can go to unbelieving friends and you can say, you guys, just come check it my, just come check my church out. Just come one time, because if you come one time, it is over, over. I'm just telling you. Because there is a magnetism to the body of Christ. There's the, the, when the resistance begins to fade, you can almost watch it because the body of Christ, when it's operating as the body of Christ, is the most attractive and persuasive group to ever be a part of. So here, here's, here's where I'm going to end. Summarize this. Ready? Jesus is doing His church. We're invited to help. And we have authority in help. That's the bottom line. Jesus is building His church. We're invited to help. And we have authority in help. So here's what I want you to do. Here's what I wanted to do with the sermon today. I, I want you to stop. A lot of you got a bad image of church. And this is what I wanted to blow up today. If we're going to talk about the solution for our world. Let me tie all this together before I end. Ready? If we're going to talk about the solution for our world... The only solution is Jesus. And the only way we're going to get them there is if you change your view of church. A lot of you have been looking at church as a place for Christians and you would never think of bringing a non-Christian here because, of course, they wouldn't be interested in the church because they're not Christians. They're not, they're not living right right now. You're thinking, oh, 
I love you, but you're thinking wrong. The church was meant to be your partners in reaching people for Jesus Christ. Everybody understand? So what I want you to do, and today I didn't do a Facebook moment the way we normally do it, because today this is part of your action step. I want you to go public with it. I want you to come out of the closet as a church person. How about that? And here's what I want you to go public and say. Don't do it right now unless you really think you're going to do it. Because all your friends are going to know, okay? This is going, this is going to be a big This ain't just saying I vote for the church. I like the church and Jesus is pretty cool too. This is deeper than that. Here's what I want you to put up there. Ready? Stanley Chapel moment of the week. Jesus said he'd build his church and nothing can stop it. Stop him. I've decided to help. Declare yourself. Declare yourself. I'm going to help Jesus build his church. I, I want to tell you something. I didn't grow up wanting to work at a church. Who wants to work at a church for crying out loud? You've got to be sick to want to work at a church. I didn't grow up wanting to work at a church. What little boy says, well, hey, I'm going to grow up and I'm going to be a preacher. Nobody does that, okay? Matter of fact, I fought hard not to be a preacher. But I did want to be a part of a movement. And I wanted to be a part of a revolution. And I've decided to give my life more heartily than that. And you know what I'm talking about. Did you know this year, and this is somewhere you can clap if you want to, this year we have commissioned 120 people have signed up for ministry at this church in 2013. Can you give Anywhere, anywhere who has that kind of percentage that's that's going on. It's, it's incredible. Because you want to be a part of a revolution too. And you can be because Jesus says, I will build my church. And nothing's going to stop it. And it's going to be good on this statement. The focal point. I am. He said, I am the Son, the Messiah. The Son of the living God. Now if you've not embraced the 1K Commission, I'm going to ask you to do that with all my heart. And here's my deal. We're going to have one more open house this year, and then we'll have another one in January, and I'm going to get you to start promoting the January 6th service, and I'm going to get you to do it. We'll give you an invitation today. If a lot of you are not prepared to go talk to your friends about Jesus, you just don't know enough, you're new in the Lord, you're not confident enough, whatever. I get that. I get that. But I've been doing this a long time. And on the last, the last Sunday of this month, I don't know the date, but open house Sunday, I'm going to preach a message that we often, I do it sometimes in basic training called when God becomes a word of word, and, and I'm going to preach that message. I will guarantee you that your friends will not be able to walk out of here that day and say they didn't know Jesus as Lord, that they didn't know about Him. And if they stand before God, their blood will be on your hands. If you get them here on the, I think it's the 29th, the last Sunday of this month, I guarantee you they're going to know about Jesus. I'm going to do it for you. What you may not can do. You may not feel comfortable sharing the gospel. That's fine. I do feel comfortable sharing the gospel. But you can do what I can't do. You know what that is? Talk to your friends. How many of you will invite one person at least on November 29th? Well, at least one person. I'm going to make sure that they hear the gospel that day. That's my commitment to you. I'm going to do my best, everything in my power, to make sure that they hear the gospel that day. You do your part, and I'm going to try to do my part. Deal? Let's shake on it. Everybody ready? There you go. Let's shake on it. Now, here we go. We're going to end this message right here. Questions to ponder. Who do you say Jesus is? If you don't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that's your number one question. You will never answer a question more important than that. All roads don't lead to God. Jesus says He's the only way. you got to decide if you believe that or not. Who do you say Jesus is? Second question. This is for those who've already answered that question. I know who Jesus is. Then here's the second question. Who are you binding to Jesus' kingdom? So I ain't really ever thought about that. You made the king today, ain't you? Because you got the keys to the kingdom. And he was never interested in you just coming to church on Sunday morning. His goal from the get-go was to build a movement. And he's given you the authority and power to be his body to help him do that. And you get to accept it or not. How many of you understand today? Raise your hand good night. Would you stand with me, please? Father, I thank you for who you are, and I thank you for your presence, and I thank you for your power, and I thank you for your grace and your wisdom. And I ask that you would use this, drill it down deep in our heart and soul. 
This is not about building Stanley Chapel. This is about building your movement, your kingdom. And God, I pray people get that. I pray they get it. This is about two things. Making sure people here know who Jesus is. If you, if, you, if you know who Jesus is, but you've not really ever bought into Him, and you've not really ever made Him Lord of your life, would you pray this prayer and say, God, I'm sorry for my sins. Forgive me. From this day forward, I want to do life with you. If you're praying that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. This altar is open. Let's worship the Lord. Let's make some commitments to Him to build His church.